Tonight, a reckoning for Australian politics, parliament and women. But what of justice and the presumption of innocence? You've got lots of questions. Welcome to Q&A. Welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, Government Senator for Queensland, Susan MacDonald. News.com political editor, Samantha Maiden. Lawyer and former Liberal staffer, Danya Mani, who has spoken publicly about her own sexual assault allegations. WA Labor MP, Anne Ali. And artificial intelligence expert, Kate Crawford, who's appearing at Sydney's All About Women Festival this weekend. Please make all of them feel welcome. Now, later in the program, we'll speak to author and feminist Isabel Allende. At 78, she's still fierce, still fantastic, and still having sex. You can replace, you know, energy. You can replace the energy with laughter and marijuana and, um, <laughs> I don't know, companionship, kindness. But so, humour, good humour helps a lot. Some tips on love coming up. You can stream us live on iView and all the socials and you can join the conversation on Instagram and Twitter. Quanda is the hashtag. Please do keep it respectful. Our first question tonight comes from Luther Utai Kamara. Thank you. There are reports today that uh, <coughs> Defence Minister uh, Linda Reynolds called Brittany Higgins, quote unquote, a lying cow. Now, uh, if a senior public servant or a uh, business executive uses that language in a workplace, it could very well lead to disciplinary action. Uh, so the question is, why are the leaders of this country, uh, that is, ministers and parliamentarians, held to a lower standard than the rest of us? And Ali. Um, thank you, Luther, for that question. And I think you reflect the tone of many Australians who are watching what's unfolding in Parliament and thinking exactly the same thing. If that was me or if that was my workplace, I know what would have happened. And why do parliamentarians, why are politicians uh, above the standards that... that, uh, that Australians are held to? Why are they not being held accountable? Why do they keep getting away with things that we wouldn't get away with? You know, when we're elected to represent our, our constituencies, we're elected as one of the people, not as being above the people, not as being uh, different from the people, but as being one of the people. And as being one of the people, we should lead by example. I completely agree with you that what we are seeing over the past three weeks does an incredible disservice to our democracy, does an incredible disservice to the idea of representation and that those of us who hold high office in Parliament uh, reflect the wishes, the concerns, uh, the diversity and the standards that Australians expect and that we expect of Australians that we expect of our nation. Susan MacDonald, I note that Linda Reynolds, your, your colleague in the Senate, did not deny having called Brittany Higgins a lying cow. So I think one of the other things that I would say to you, Luther, is that the Senate... Uh, I've been in the Senate for nearly 18 months. And one of the things that I have found most surprising is uh, how robust it is. And, in fact, uh, looking at the school kids here tonight, I think about the school kids who line the top of the Senate chamber to come for question time. And I have to tell you, I don't think it shows us in a good light. The last two weeks have been incredibly tough on Senator uh, Linda Reynolds. She is a very ca uh, capable minister, but more importantly, she is an incredibly compassionate woman and a great leader. And this has rocked her to the core because she feels so strongly uh, for her team and the women in her lives because of some experiences in her past. So, Do you think I, her behaviour demonstrates that, if indeed she did say this? I, I think what her, her behaviour demonstrates is that she's very human. And I know that I've said things that I regret and she has apologised to her staff uh, for, for the words she used. But I do think um, the... the, the the process of Parliament and the performance of the Senate is incredibly tough and she's a, a, a very kind and decent person who was caught saying something that she has said later that she regretted. I think we should do well to reflect on what makes us human and some of our frailties. Well, to be honest, 
uh, there is nothing human or compassionate about calling an alleged rape victim a lying cow. Yeah. <laughs> I do note that Senator Reynolds, in her defence, has claimed that she wasn't referring directly to the rape allegations, but to um, what she said about what, what followed, essentially what happened in the workplace in terms of the support. But I'll tell you who'd had a bad week in the office. Mm -hmm. It was the staffer who mm -hmm. got raped, not Linda Reynolds. And she should apologise to Brittany Higgins for those remarks, and she hasn't. We need to note that it is an alleged rape at this point. Dania Marnie, you've worked in Parliament, mm. you've dealt with bosses. Um, what do you make of these reports that Linda Reynolds said those words in relation to Brittany Higgins, whatever the context? Well, the first thing that I have to point out, and that I regret, you know, in relation to the comments that we've just heard, um, from a parliamentarian federally, is that this conversation is far too focused on enabling, justifying, forgiving, mm. allowing anything, any conduct, no matter how sexist, no matter how misogynistic, from any person in political office. At what point is enough enough? A lying cow, really. That, that, that's meant to be language that we're meant to look on as a, a woman's kindness and compassion. But is, is this exclusively about the Liberal Party or the Coalition, though? I mean, are we talking about a broader all. political culture? I think we're talking absolutely about broader political culture. I think, you know, it's been unfortunate and sad that we've not seen people standing up from all sides of politics, whether that be the Labor Party, um, whether that be the Nationals or, or the Greens, and saying that they need to take ownership mm. of this issue as well. This isn't just something that occurs within the Liberal Party. But I think... For there to be an environment that exists in which an extremely senior woman in politics felt that she'd be able to say that somebody who is extremely traumatised and has come forward with rape allegations is a lying cow, is a reflection of just how broken our parliaments are, of just how misogynistic our parliaments can be, and of the gaslighting and abuse that parliamentarians are prepared to put at the feet of survivors. Because it's one thing to say in her statement, oh, well, I didn't call her a liar about the allegations. Well, you're trying to smear her about everything else. What does that say about the respect that women in the most senior offices in this country have for women who are coming forward about these things? And, and I think it's something that our senior female politicians really need to look on the inside about and they need to question, have I internalised misogyny? Am I a part of the problem now? And frankly, I'm sad to say that Linda Reynolds is part of the problem. And, you know, as our questioner has said, usually there'd be disciplinary action. There needs to be disciplinary action. Kate Crawford, you, you work... <laughs> Kate Crawford, you work in big tech. Uh, this is an extremely male-dominated environment. How do you observe this conversation the, and the events unfolding in Australia right mm. now? Well, I mean, it's been extraordinary, I have to say, that I think Australia is having a moment. I think this is a time in the country where we're all stopping to say exactly how is this occurring in the highest offices mm. of the land. And it is part of a broader structural problem, I have to say, across male-dominated industries. And certainly I see this across technology as well. Just in the last few weeks, we've been seeing a, a complete scandal playing out at Google where we're seeing senior women being fired. And again, it's the same gaslighting. It's the same undermining of, of women's authority and of their voice and of their stories. But what is gaslighting? Not everyone uses this term, but it's frequently used today. What does it mean? What, what, what happens in a workplace that's, that's gaslighting? I mean, it's, it's a really good question because I think it plays out in different ways. But it's really about how you try to retell someone's story mm -hmm. or to try and essentially undermine their voice. And you can do that by just saying their story didn't happen or by attacking their character. In the or case they're of, a nice person, or they're so it's an, OK. Precisely. Or they don't really know what they're talking about. Or that's not exactly what happened, dear. It can be a form of deep kind of patronising attitude or it can be an intentional way to undercut the truth of a statement if it looks like it might actually harm a but person. But could it also be what happens when someone's defending themselves about something or trying to explain something? I mean, is it easy to define gaslighting and say that's, that's an example of that? 
Look, you're absolutely right that when it comes to these sorts of situations, we're talking about stories versus stories. But the question is, how do you actually deal with this in a diplomatic and sensitive way? And I think what we've seen over the last week has been absolutely shocking. And it is a sign that we need much deeper training, sensitivity and concern, particularly when it comes to parliamentarians. OK, let's take our next question. It comes from Noah Smith. Hi. Every year, our trust in politicians seems to hit a new low. Ministers used to resign over small things, but today ministers hardly ever resign or step down. My question is, do you think the PM should launch an independent inquiry into the rape allegations against <coughs> Christian Porter? I think we just need to be clear, it's a single allegation, not multiple. Uh, uh, Christian Porter does strenuously deny this allegation Understand. that has been put. Susan MacDonald... Uh, this is a tragedy and I feel so deeply, um, both for the woman who's concerned and for her family, I, I can't begin to imagine. Um, we do have a system of, of justice in this country. We do have a police service that is well-resourced and the most capable of understanding whether or not uh, some evidence needs to go to trial, and they have closed the matter. Um, I, I don't think that this is an easy subject, but we can't have a situation where allegations equate to guilt. And I think that uh, the, the Minister has um, made a full statement, and I think that we need to have some justice in the law and the rules of the land, because otherwise, um, you know, do we become a kangaroo court and a, a court of public opinion? What about justice for, for the all victim? All of us who have um, uh, family, people in our lives who um, may ever be unjustly accused, uh, that we want them to have a right of reply. That is, that is our legal system. But we, we keep talking about justice for the accused. What about justice for the victim? What about justice for the victim? We've... <laughs> You know, I am, I, am, I am infuriated by this because I'm sick and tired of the lip service that we hear in Parliament about hearing victims' voices, about listening to women, about respect for women. And right now is a moment. Right now is a moment for the Prime Minister to show leadership here and action not just words. And what did he do? He came out and he said, oh, well, I've asked him if he did it and he said no and that's enough for me. And then suddenly you've got all of these men invoking justice, justice, justice. Where was justice and procedural fairness for all the victims of robo-debt? Yeah. <clears throat> Can we just be clear, though, about what you're actually asking for? What, if you're saying you want action, what is the action you want? I want an inquiry. I think that this what, what is a kind serious... What kind of inquiry? I well... First of all, the police haven't closed it because South Australian police are still determining whether there is um, a coronial inquest to be undertaken. And so that, relate, that, that relates to, related to, the death to her of this death. individual. This is not in relation. And to, that may to the well be. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Hamish. And that may well be um, a process that um, opens up. Um, uh, some more evidence or, or that either exonerates... OK, um, but, but you're saying tonight you want action from the Prime Minister. I just want to establish what exactly you want. I would like the Prime Minister to establish an independent inquiry. The fact that the police are not pursuing the matter for, for, for practical reasons does not preclude or prevent the Prime Minister from undertaking an inquiry into a very serious allegation that, and that inquiry uh, will either exonerate uh, Christian Porter and prove his innocence, as he is, um, as, as he is um, saying, that he is innocent, or it will prove otherwise. Either way, this is a serious, serious allegation and it needs to be treated so seriously. Just briefly, Dania, what kind of inquiry or investigation do you want specifically? I think that there should be a High Court inquiry. We're talking about the Chief Law Officer of this country. I think it's appropriate as a result that the High Court is the body to examine the veracity um, of, of my friend's um, allegations. And I think, you know, it's insulting to suggest... But just specifically, though, what do you mean? You're talking about a retired High Court yes, Justice... Yes, re retired High Court this? Justice. Perhaps um, former Justice Bell would be an appropriate choice to examine these allegations. And for the purposes of that inquiry, the statement 
that my friend completed but was unable to sign because of COVID, of no fault of her own because of COVID, should be deemed admissible for the purposes of, of that inquiry. And there's precedent for a deceased individual's allegations to be to be heard and justly inquired into in, in a legal process. I mean, that's what we saw uh, in the George Pell case. We had a deceased complainant and due process was able to be upheld in that instance. So, Maiden? Yeah, look, it's a great question that you have asked, and Noah, and I think that uh, I actually share the concerns of uh, some politicians, including the Prime Minister, that there is actually a problem with setting up a quasi-judicial process in Parliament to rule on criminal matters. And I think there is an argument that that's a poor precedent. So personally, I mean, what I would like to see is a coronial inquest. I think that there is a strong argument that the justice system has failed uh, not only uh, the alleged victim, but Christian Porter, because he has not been given the opportunity to be interviewed by police, to provide an affidavit, uh, to have witnesses come forward. So... Can, can I just ask Susan McDonald, do you think that's important from Christian Porter's point of view? You're sort of saying here tonight you don't believe there should be any kind of other investigation, mm. but should he not go through a process where his version of events is formally put? Mm. Well, I, I think that we have a process which is the police. Um, we put a lot of faith in them to do these kind of investigations. Well, they've never interviewed Christian All Porter. The mm. time, no, because he was not given the allegations prior to reading them in the newspaper. Well, so the delays in that process on the and Friday. the insufficient so, resources. Just, just hold on a second. We'll just hear this. Uh, I do think, though, that if we have a, a police process, we have a, um, a fabulous justice system in this land that has served us well, uh, if we want to change that, then that's another conversation to have. But, you know, I think it works well for us and they have deemed that there was not... Uh, that the matter was closed because there wasn't enough admiss admissible evidence. But the point evidence. I wanted to make, Hamish, was this, right? Christian Porter has a right to the presumption of innocence. Mm. He also has a right to his good name. Mm. So let him give sworn evidence, right? Now, a coronial inquiry is never going to rule on the criminal matter. That, that, that can't really happen anymore. But it would provide an opportunity for him to give his version of events for a coroner to ask him questions about it, to ask questions about, you know, why this woman was released, um, you know, after she'd been, been under medical care and then forced to, as I understand it, quarantine at home by herself for two weeks. She rang the police during that process where she was obviously very distressed and she said that she didn't want to proceed with the uh, complaint. She cut her hair into the same style that she had had when the alleged incident occurred. Very upsetting and disturbing to people around her. And she... Uh, died by suicide the next day. So clearly all of these events, you know, of, of the, the quarantine and the discussions with police, they're all connected. And that's something that a coronial inquiry can look at. And crucially, that's something that her family wants. And her family told news.com.au today that they will support what they described as any inquiry, whether it is the sort of inquiry that you're talking about or a coronial inquest. And that's what I think should happen, because I think that Christian Porter should be given that opportunity. And, and if, as he says, this never happened, this is a shocking allegation that has destroyed his life, he should have the opportunity to say that and put his hand on the Bible and, and give sworn evidence. Yep. Let's take our next question. It comes from Anna Walker. What can we do for survivors of sexual assault beyond telling them to go to police and follow the legal process? The gap between reporting an allegation of assault and a final legal outcome can take several years. What should we do in the meantime when an incident is still alleged? Kate. Okay. Well, this is actually one of the most complicated and I think deeply personal issues that we have to contend with. This is such an important question that I think ultimately what we've, what we've been left with is this kind of skeletal legal process, which as you know, like so many women go through this process and are not believed. And so we have to look at other forms of actually contending with abuse. Now, in some ways in workplaces, we have some of those frameworks in place, but in lots of other contexts of abuse and harassment, we don't. So we have to find ways of actually empowering and supporting women who have been attacked, harassed and abused. And I think also we have to find ways to shift this conversation because certainly what I see is that we go through one of these crises every 
what is it, every year, every six months? At the moment, it's every month. And it's every industry. So what we're looking at is an endemic problem in terms of precisely the sorts of abuse of power that we're seeing across the board. So what do we do with that? I think we have to come up with much more, frankly, accountable processes in terms of how men are actually going to be treated in these sorts of situations and how women can actually support each other. But so, what you're raising is one of the hardest questions and, and there sadly is no easy, straightforward answer to it. And Ali, we're talking here about uh, believing the account uh, of the complainant or the alleged victim. But we also have a system of justice which presumes in innocence. Mm. How do those two principles coexist? It's a really vexed issue, Hamish. And Anna, your question is such a such a complex question. It's um, you know, we we want to believe victims and we should believe victims. And the reason that many women don't come forward is because they're not believed. The reason many women don't come forward is because the fact is that less than 3% of complaints about sexual assault actually result in, uh, in a prosecution. Um, so we can't rely on the, on the legal system. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we can't. We can't rely on the police investigation. And in the meantime, women relive and relive relive and relive that trauma throughout that process. It is a fine balancing act between uh, the presumption of innocence and, and, and one of the things do, that... Do you think they... Honestly, do you think both of these principles can live together? I think they can. I think they can. I don't think they do now. Mm. I don't think they do at the moment. And the reason I say that, Hamish, is looking over the last um, couple of days um, and listening to, in defence of uh, Christian Porter, the, the discussion about justice has all been about justice for him, his access to the justice system, his presumption of innocence, his access to procedural fairness, and the victim has been forgotten. And too often that's what happens, is the victim gets forgotten and the presumption of innocence gets held above that. And all that does is re-traumatise victims, it keeps victims silent, it perpetuates the structural inequalities that, that keep sexual assaults happening. Daniel Mani, you took your own mm. allegations of assault um, within politics all the way to the Prime Minister's office. Mm. Were you believed? Was that your experience of informing uh, of those allegations at the highest level? No, sadly, no. Um, you know, in the conversation that I had with a senior staff member in the Prime Minister's office, um, I was essentially told, why didn't you go to the police? Why didn't you tell everybody else to go to the police? Um, I received a denial. I had sort of said in that conversation, I'm receiving a number of complaints from other women. Some of them include complaints about how the Prime Minister's office is handled what women are coming forward with. And he just said, I deny that because we have a zero tolerance policy. I'm sorry, mate. How did that zero tolerance policy work out for Brittany Higgins, for me, for anybody else? This society absolutely tolerates and enables sexual crime being committed against women. And we see the literal casualties that come from the failures of that system. The reason she isn't here is because every part of this system is stacked against survivors, from the police through to the legal system. And through to the conversations that we have in society and how our politicians speak about it, we talk about a well-funded police force. My friend had wanted to sign a police statement. Police didn't come to her to facilitate that. We talk about a well-resourced police force. Well, we don't have training that's consistent across this country so that people know how to interview survivors. I was speaking with a researcher today and she'd said to me that, um, you know, she'd heard a case from a woman that she was working with who had said, oh, you know, the police told me that because I didn't say that I'd been hit, that they couldn't do anything. But the same woman's husband had threatened to kill her and her children by driving a car into a tree, you know? What police system, what system is really justly there for survivors? I think the first thing we need to do is realise that there is no just place, whether it's the most senior areas of our political sphere, whether it's the police or anywhere else, we just don't have anything for survivors and we need to recognise we don't have anything and we need to start from scratch and build something. We don't need an inquiry. We just need for politicians to finally commit 
to a, enabling a suite of reforms across the justice system, the healthcare system and beyond. Susan McDonald, do you think these ideas can coexist? Presumption well, of innocence and also... Uh, believing the account of, yeah. of the alleged victim. I, I want to go back to Anna's question first, if I could, because I think that it is um, incredibly important. And so on Monday, I went out to Yamba Meda and Townsville and spent time with the domestic violence and, and women's refuge um, uh, centres to, to understand what their views were. And uh, it, it was incredibly... Um, distressing to hear some of their stories, but also the amount of time that it takes many women to come forward to recover physically and emotionally, ready to provide a, um, a statement or to go through counselling. Um, they provide a terrific service. And I think that there are incredible people out there providing exactly this sort of support. And we need to be providing them with more, um, uh, more resources and, uh, and, and more exposure. So I think out of this horrific couple of weeks, what I'm pleased about is that Australia is having this conversation because it isn't just Parliament. This applies to uh, small businesses across the land who have a similar kind of structure. No HR department, that the only reporting mechanism you might have is, is to a very small team or perhaps your boss. And so I think this is an Australian-wide issue, that we, we need to be talking about our culture, talking about change. And I'm really, really feeling positive about if that's the outcome that we can talk about. And instead of talking about airbags on the car, we start talking about putting brakes on, because I think it is cultural, it is across Australia, and this is our opportunity to take hold of the issue and the agenda and make sure that there are permanent changes, because but, I agree. But, Susan, if I may... It strikes me that the moment for conversation has passed. Yes. And I think mm. Dania has just given us a spectacularly important comment around how we actually push for reform across the entire system. Mm. Judicial reform, police reform, and frankly, even media reform in terms of Absolutely. how we talk about these issues. Yeah. It's just, in some ways, it's just extremely re-traumatising for mm. victims to go yeah. through this you know, retelling and having to re-perform their yeah. own trauma. So I think at this moment, we have to say, what is the real reform that we're going to have? Mm. And how are leaders going to take responsibility for changing the situation? And so well, when in I see terms the of the point you're making, I mean, I turned on a couple of television stations today and basically heard that the woman that ha made the accusations against Mr Porter, who's not with us anymore, basically... Who, who, who knew, you knew as a young woman? Who I went to school with and I, I knew very well uh, and she was, you know, as many people have said, she was regarded as the most brilliant girl at school, right? She really was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I turned on the television to journalists talking about the fact that because she uh, had mental health issues later in life, that she might have uh, disassociated, um, hallucinated, imagined things, right? Now, I knew her as a young person, right? I don't know what happened to her in the intervening years, right? But when Christian Porter says that he's going to get mental health support, we applaud him as a hero. When she says, mm. I got mental health treatment, we say she's crazy and she must be making it up. I want to just point out at this stage <laughs> that if this conversation raises any issues for you, you can contact 1800 RESPECT or Lifeline on the numbers on your screen right now. So if we can just finish on this point, because I think it is important. So at a political level, we might be talking about it, but in homes right across regional Australia and workplaces, in, um, in lots of areas where there are not many women working, uh, you know, I think this is a conversation that hasn't started across Australia, mm -hmm. or it has only just started. So uh, I'm a big believer in that change has to come from what Australian wants. Mm -hmm. Politicians imposing... Uh, rules and regulations is generally not the best outcome. So I want Australians to be involved in this and to drive this. If I, if I may on that, mm -hmm. um, from the perspective of somebody who is a survivor and has tried to advocate on these issues, when I called the Prime Minister's office in 2019, I asked for assistance to have a meeting with the Prime Minister so that I could talk about the overwhelming number of disclosures I'd already received. Um, I was told by that senior staff member that I would be contact the, contacted the next day to facilitate a meeting, but only after he had insultingly said to me that I could just write to the Prime Minister like any other member of the public. I was on the phone with a senior staff member 
and they just told me to write like any other member of the public when I had called in distress. I was desperate. I tried to make a complaint that Gladys Berejiklian at a state level has still never even acknowledged, that I've never gotten any resolution for. And no one ever contacted me. And then again on the 16th of February this year, after innumerable disclosures, I wrote to the Prime Minister again and summarised the findings that survivors, uh, you know, with survivor disclosures and what they wanted to change and the law reform they wanted. No response. I asked for a response within 14 days because of, of how urgent the issue was. No one's ever bothered to contact me. Like, what does it take for people to actually listen to survivors? Because we're trying to be heard and no one is listening to us. I mean, it would be, would you be willing to sort of help with that? Because I've been trying extremely hard. I think that you'll find that there is a nation of people who are willing to help with that. But will our Prime Minister? And I am I'm, uh, very sorry that this has been your experience and other women's experience. And now we have the opportunity with a, a roar to make change. And I think that's the opportunity from this, this I, conversation. I do want us to hear from a young person who is doing exactly that, that does want to make change. Uh, this next question is for our politicians. Uh, it's a video who, from a young woman who you may have heard about or read about. She started a petition to change consent education in schools. Her name is Chanel. Hi Suzanne and Anne. My petition for more holistic consent education in Australia from an earlier age is getting a lot of support from members of Parliament in New South Wales. Since testimonies are emerging from Queensland and Western Australia, I was wondering if you'll support educational reform in your states. Anne Ali. 100%. 100%. Um, we do need to start at an early age with um, educating young people about consent. Uh, I would include in there about coercive control. I'm part of a campaign around coercive control as well. But education is not the be-all and end-all. Let me put that very clearly. When I was 17 and I was sitting on the grass with my girlfriends at school and I said, you know, if a man ever raised his hand to me, I would knee him in the balls and walk out the door. And I went back when a man did raise his hand to me. I went back several times when a man raised his hand to me and I did not walk out that door and I did not knee him in the balls. So education is part of it, absolutely, definitely. We do need to educate young people. We need to educate adults as well because much of um, uh, many um, ideas about relationships and healthy relationships are also learned in the home. Uh, so education, yes, but also um, the, the increasing of services, uh, having somewhere for, for women to go, uh, for victims to go, women or men, um, having them to uh, somewhere for them to go. Cultural change happens generationally and it happens very slowly. And, and just if I may, Hamish, on the last point, with respect, Susan, I'm quite astounded that you're saying we're only just having the conversation now and that in parts of the country the conversation hasn't been happening. I've been having the conversation for 30 years. I'm actually quite tired of talking about it and I just want to see action. Education to begin with, but a whole range of support services as well. And, and if, if I, I can, response, if I can though, add from, to that from Susan because the question was to, to our two politicians. Mm. Do you support the idea of changing education around consent? Yeah, absolutely. I think that across the nation we have different um, definitions, but at a more practical level, I think that there are young men and young women who have who are really struggling to understand now what does the interaction look like, what's OK? And so I think it's, it's urgently needed and I think education's a great start. I want to bring in one of those young men who's in the audience tonight. There's a bunch of young men that have written in to us about this issue. Joseph Anderson, I think, is uh, in one of the back rows. Joseph, how much are you talking about these issues around consent with your mates at school? Yeah, definitely. We are sort of brought it up last week where it's big in the news and we're deeply concerned about it and... Yeah, we want to see, like, how this goes and the reforms that can be made and, yeah. Is it confusing to you? Does it need clarification? I mean, how, much, how confident do you feel with what you've been taught so far around these ideas of consent? Well, definitely not confident enough for boys around Australia because it's obviously not working and there's obviously an underlying issue that needs to uh, be addressed. And, and do you have a view as to who should be teaching this to you or communicating this to you? Is it your parents? Is it the school? Is it politicians or, or people sitting having a debate? I mean, what, what's your view? Well, I feel that I'm probably not the best person to ask that. I feel someone with a more advanced sort of knowledge, like, 
people on the panellists should comment on that. Like, yeah. Okay, Kate, who should be teaching young guys like Joseph that genuinely want to know? Mm. Well, Joseph, first of all, thank you for talking about it. Mm. And I think in some ways you're kind of really exemplifying why I think young people are so far ahead of this debate. Like, even talking about the fact that consent is confusing, it is something that has to be negotiated, in many cases entirely non-verbally. Like, these are things that young people are talking about. When I think about where the problem is, it's not with young people, actually, it's with the baby boomers and beyond yes. generations, and particularly at the moment... So, if the, if the grown-ups are confused, leaders. how are they going to tell young guys like Precisely. Joseph what the answer is? That's exactly right. right, Hamish. And so, this is another reason why I say, mm -hmm. rather than always putting this at the foot of young people, we have to educate them, we have to train them better, mm -hmm. we should be looking at leaders. We should be looking at the Prime Minister and saying, how are you going to show that we're actually going to take action differently this Sam time? Sam Look, I've uh, got uh, two boys um, that are about your age or a little bit younger, and, like, I know there's lots of great young men and a lot of great men uh, out there thinking about these issues. On one level, I don't think consent is really that confusing. Is it really that confusing? I'm not sure that it is. But um, if, if society at large is having a conversation about yeah. the definitions, right? Yeah. Mm. I mean, for a young person that's grappling with this for the first time, presumably, yeah. that must be something that they have to consider and take in. The, the grown-ups are all debating this, right? Yeah. Um, how does a young person get clarity on it? Yeah, and I'd love to see a whole program, you know, talking to people such as yourself about those issues. One of the things that concerns me as a parent uh, is the issue of pornography. So, uh, for all those who think I'm some terrible prude, I have no problem with pornography, adults watching pornography, but I do think that there's a problem in society now that it is so available on the internet uh, that it is really, uh, in many ways, the first sexual experience people have is seeing that stuff. And they're having that experience before they're actually dealing with a human being. So perhaps when I was growing up and, and people my parents' generation, I'm not saying for a minute that sexual assault and consent issues didn't arise because they did, but when you're having those first experiences, it was with a human being. And my concern is that a lot of the pornography that is available is very violent, it's very aggressive. You, you know, you've had women like Chanel talk about the fact that that has an impact in terms of the sort of sex that boys expect or think is normal. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, whatever people want to do when they're consenting adults, that's their business. But if that pornography is having a corrosive effect at an early age in terms of expectations, what women want, um, you know, how to actually have a good time, I think that's a, a big problem. Okay. I agree. I think that is a really big issue. And I, too, have sons and we and a daughter and we discuss these things. I'm, I'm very big on talking about talk what about women porn? want. You talk, about, you talk about porn? I know. It's really distressing to my sons. They would really <laughs> rather that I didn't. And they do it on television. But I think, <laughs> I think it's important conversation. All right. We're going to get to some other topics right now. Our next question comes from Maria Hakim. Anthony Albanese consistently criticises Scott Morrison's approach on tackling climate change as weak and ineffective. He's publicly opposing the coalition one time, but then adopting the same policy ideas the next, such as medium-term target and favouring gas-powered energy in the transition to low emissions. How are his goals for net zero in 2050 any different? And Ali. Um, thank you, Maria. And um, it's a really good question. And I can understand... Um, why you have those questions. Um, She's not the only one. A lot of people have questions about what Labor's policy is yeah, I, on, on look, emissions reduction. I get it, Hamish. I really do. I do I do get it. I think... Do you um, have questions yourself about what your policies are? I have questions about everything. Don't okay. even get me started. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could have a whole show on the qu questions by Anne Alley. Um, but, um, Maria, look, we are committed to uh, net zero emissions by 2050. We've made that very, very clear. Um, the fact is that we are in opposition, and I noticed that you started your question with the fact that Anthony Albanese is very critical of Scott Morrison and his position on it, and that's because we are in opposition. We do not have the power or the levers to actually make urgent change on climate change. But, but we do you not want have them. The you, I mean, the there, there could be an election within the, the next year. You, you're saying that you you want to be the government, and you can't. 
the tell women of the us. government. Okay, but, so but you, this, but but, but government, Hamish, this government has been around for what is this? It's their third term in, in parliament now, and we still don't have a, 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 a climate change policy because there are coal huggers within the uh, within the coalition. Kate, like, how do, how do surely... you view this in Australian politics that we we have <laughs> an opposition that says it wants to be in power but doesn't have a roadmap to net zero by 2050? It doesn't have a clear commitment to an interim target uh, and we all know the climate wars that have dragged on in Australia for a dec decade or so. How do you observe it? Well, I have to say, Hamish, it's, it's embarrassing at this point mm. in terms of what's going on in this country that it's still a party political issue. Mm. We face one of the biggest crises that we will possibly imagine and Australia, frankly, is right on the bleeding edge of this problem. We should be coming up with the most innovative policy, the most extraordinary forms of change and instead as you say, we have coal huggers in the back row. We have, I have to say, a little bit of waffling and uncertainty from the Labor Party. Mm -hmm. We could expect a lot more. While in the US, which is where I'm based, all the problems are there are very real, but at least there's a vision around a Green New but, Deal. But it is party political in the US, right? Oh, it's, not, it's not like there's agreement universally in American politics on this. I mean, it's it... a mess, let's yeah. be clear. But at least there is a clear vision of what we could do. So you'll say that about the Green New Deal. It's mm. very precise about what the target should be and how we'll get there. Labor hasn't got that yet. But and, is, and this but is, is the most but, important but issue. But are targets only just part of the, 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 the solution? I mean, you know... Anthony Albanese has stood up and talked about a transition to renewables, about uh, Labor's commitment to that, and and the fact is that we need to transition and we need a just transition. But hey, we you need to criticise the other side cars. for not having clear targets for 2050, and now you're defending your own lack of. I don't know that I'm defending it. I'm saying that targets are a part of the bigger solution. If you if, you know you could come up with targets, but does that actually put anything into place that's going to does that does that actually start a chain of of action? To that actually makes a difference? Or do you need something that's a bit... that's much more broad and comprehensive around renewables and a transition to renewables, which we have talked about, which Anthony Al Albanese has talked about? Okay. Australia That's... has missed every target so far. So, you know, targets aren't going to cut it. We, we really do have to talk about, at this point, radical change. Absolutely. And the fact that there isn't actually a clear answer that Anne was able to provide to that question is extremely important. And... Let me be clear, it's not for a moment that I'm suggesting that this is only an issue with Labor, but it is a problem that an opposition that wants to be in government can't clearly articulate how it actually intends to solve something that is literally a global crisis that threatens the health, well-being and safety of every single person in this room and every single person in this world. Like, that should be an absolute priority in any election platform. And, I mean, too, obviously, with, with the coalition, they've absolutely failed in their duty to deal with this problem. And I think what's important is how We backwards... should be clear for the audience. You are a member of the Liberal Party. Absolutely, I am. And they've gone extremely far backwards. And mm. I decry that because it's absurd to me that somehow, um, for all of his faults, and I disagree with him on many things, the one thing I did like about John Howard was that he went to his last election with an ETS. This was then bandied back and forth by both major parties as something that they were going to enact, and now it's become political poison to talk about. There needs to just be an ETS. Both parties just need to just pull their heads out of their asses and realise if John Howard thought of it then and other parties have thought of it later, maybe, I don't know, could there possibly be bipartisan agreement? You make it sound really simple. Let's take That's our next right. question. If only. It comes from Ben Morford. Kate, is Facebook salvageable? When you weigh the meagre benefits versus the potentially catastrophic consequences, is there anything there capable of being saved? Or should we all just cancel our Facebook accounts? <laughs> ben, I love this question. Can I just tell you what an extraordinarily jaw-dropping month it has been to see Facebook just decide in the process of a negotiation with the government that they were just going to switch off the news feed, just turn off the pump just to show that we can? I mean, this is literally gangster tactics. I mean, this is, this is the sort of behaviour that, frankly, I think even Facebook now is looking back saying, what were we doing? Because the mm -hmm. fact that not only did we lose news, we lost services, including services for sexual abuse survivors, mm -hmm. all turned off at the same time, it looks so bad. But here's the big issue. 
That whole debate with Facebook and the Australian government was really a battle between two different forms of concentrated power. We had old media power, in the case of like the mega fauna of the Murdochs, and then we have new media power, which is Facebook. And Facebook has shown that they are going to bring the most extraordinary kinds of tactics to try and pressure regulators to change the way that we legislate tech companies. So what I'm really worried about with Facebook is actually at a geopolitical level. They have shown that if they don't get the laws they want, they will take their toys and go home. And this is not how we should be making regulation for tech companies. It's an incredibly important moment. They should be absolutely legislated within things around privacy, data protection, discrimination, you name it. So there's a long way to go. So tech my tech great hope is that we can actually see this as a jumping off point to say, what kind of regulation do we need? But the Australian government claims a big win here in forcing Facebook to stump up some cash for the mm. news organisations mm. and for returning or switching the tap back on for, for news feeds on their platform in Australia. The Australian government did respond to them by amending the legislation, making pretty significant changes to the technical as aspects of what they were implementing. So in your view, who really caved into who? Well, what we know is that Facebook cut a very large check to Murdoch and to Nine and to Seven. What we do know is that the Australian citizenry were the ones who lost out, who were the meat in the grinder, who had services just cut off in the same week as... That's right, the vaccines are rolling out. I mean, it was so extraordinary that in the end, what I think you're seeing is a really a negotiation between two different forms of profoundly concentrated power. And what's missing out here is a real conversation about public governance. Now, what is the role of governments in actually t coming up with regulations that will work here? This was not that legislation, and this, this code, unfortunately, is not the one that we need. Susan McDonald, you were part of the Senate hearings yeah. on all of this. I know you think it was a big win, but uh, Kate's making the point that actually yeah. it was all of us in Australia that kind of lost out yeah. here. Well, having had the benefit of sitting on the uh, Senate inquiry for quite a bit of time and um, hearing a lot of evidence from right across uh, the country and the different spectrums of media, both the digital platforms and, um, and old media, uh, as well as the ABC, SBS, Yes, free to air TV and regional newspapers. Um, it was a, a terrific conversation, um, and it was it was world leading because the rest of the world has looked at Australia to see how they might move forward, because they have not been able to uh, reach a satisfactory outcome yet. So uh, the process was good. Uh, Google and Facebook both threatened, both bullied Australia, and I was really proud that we stood up to it. And we said, no, we're going to continue with this uh, re legislated code of conduct with significant penalties. And best of all, we're going to actually properly uh, remunerate uh, our journalists in this country because it's such an important forum. Uh, journalists hold governments, business, uh, all of us to account. But and, in case you said it's bad legislation. Well, can I just finish explaining that regionally uh, it is our newspapers who report on local issues, on community events and keep us tied together. Um, I, I disagree with Kate because I think that the, the outcome we ended up with is going to uh, distribute funds uh, back into the Australian economy. Previously, small businesses, big businesses used to advertise with their newspapers and on TV. Uh, Google and Facebook now have uh, 80 or 90 per cent of that digital market. And so that money has been sucked out of the Australian economy. It's not taxed uh, in the way that we would like to see it in Australia, in Australian hands, and benefiting Australian journalists. So why didn't you change the tax laws? Because that wasn't the legislation that was before us. The legislation that was before us was regulating the digital platforms. And I'm delighted that the ABC has committed to spending uh, any of its additional funds into regional Australia, where 357 of the 4,000-odd uh, uh, content makers, which you all are called now, um, will I go to regional that. Australia. I didn't think that I was know, in my I know. Go back and check that. But it's going to go back to regional Australia because if it's our ABC, they report on things that are important to the whole country. But and, Susan, uh, so that's exciting. If I may, uh, that's a very rosy picture and, and I wish it were entirely true. But if we look at where the funds raised by this are really going to go, the vast majority, over 85%, will be going to Murdoch 9 right. and 7. It won't be going to precisely those regional mm. newspapers that mm. most need it and it won't be going to the public broadcasters that I think really deserve yeah. it. So this, this isn't a well-framed code and if we look at who's benefiting most, it really is those companies who are closely aligned with the Morrison government. So I think we have to ask much harder. <laughs>
Sam Maiden. I have to say, though, that... Uh, you know, a number of the organisations that you mentioned, including News Corp, actually have very strong presence in regional Australia. And this money will help uh, those journalists do that work. But will it all go to journalism, though? I mean, that's the, that's the question, because there's nothing in this legislation that forces news. Clearly, it will allow companies to keep journalists in job and to do that work. Mm. And, you know, in a week when... You know, journalism has been really important in the last couple you of weeks. You could be a politician. That was, right? that was, that was a pretty good <laughs> no, answer. No, but, the, like, journalists can't do their jobs if there's no jobs to do. And, you know, I'm still very hopeful that I think there are positive things that come from Facebook, the communities that are built, the information that is shared in local communities, in not just regional communities, but in suburbs. And if we can, uh, you know... Yes, I think they did behave like gangsters. I think you're absolutely right, um, to their detriment. But if some good can come out of that that actually funds journalism, I, I think that's a good thing. OK. Mm. Our next question comes from Beverly Baker. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a 70-year-old woman and I'm still in paid employment. I'm fortunate because our employers, according to the Human Rights Commission's review, aren't keen on employing older women like me. With so many women like me out of work and wanting to work, uh, what do you think that we can do to change the minds and encourage employers to take on uh, older women uh, rather than hold the belief that over 50, um, you're too old? Before we go to the panel, you've got the mic. What's the pitch? What's the job pitch <laughs> for older women to these employers that, that are not convinced? The job pitch is that with... Uh, age, you bring experience. I'm 70. I look at the contribution I've made to my employers, in my employees, to the people that I have volunteered with. Between 50 and 70, that's my best work. That is my best work. I'm not struggling to raise a family. They're all on their feet. I can then give back. And it, were I 50 today and being asked, looking for jobs, I'd be on that insulting thing called New Start or whatever they're calling the jolly thing now, giving me a, 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 a no money to live on. I think you're talking about Job Seeker. That, I don't yeah. care what the thing's called. It's not enough. <laughs> um, it's just ridiculous. Let's let, let's let Susan McDonald respond to that. Yeah. So, um, as as a recently arrived politician, less than eighteen months, uh, and coming from a business background, I completely agree that it is uh, people with experience, uh, not just in the job, but you know, with life. Uh, providing mentor skills to younger people, providing balance, providing a culture. You know, which is something that we're talking about. So I completely agree with you. And, and I think there are a few challenges which you've probably come across. And, you know, one is that uh, from the time you've been away from work, technology's changed. And so there are. There are government programs that have been around for a few years that assist uh, particularly women to reskill. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's really important. But I think it's a particularly important topic. We know, though, that the COVID recession impacted women more than it did men. Mm. Uh, obviously, the changes to Job Seeker are therefore going to impact women disproportionately. Do you think the amount, the new amount for Job Seeker, is enough? Well, I think that it's. Um, I, I sit very close to the Greens, and they're always shouting out, "Can you survive on this amount or that amount?" What they fail to ever talk about is all the other assistances and the packages. Uh, I don't think anybody pretends that a Job Seeker is designed to be a lifetime payment. It is designed, along with all the other government incentives, to get people back to work as soon as they can, because that's, that is the best uh, place. You know, we all want to be having a purpose and having a, a, a you know, a mission in our lives. So I think that uh, we fail to talk about uh, all the, you know, rent assistance and phone assist and electricity assist, uh, the family allowance if you have children. Uh, there are other, other parts to Job Seeker that you know, it's never discussed in the very quick grab. And Ali? Um, I just want to go back to Beverly's question first, um, Beverly. And, um, you know, my office uh, often has women who are over 50 coming in and saying that they've been with the company for 30, 35 years and have lost their jobs. And it is nigh on impo impossible for them to find um, another job. Uh, a lot of this comes back to valuing uh, valuing experience, uh, valuing skills. You know, women, as we age, we become more invisible, don't we? 
you know, and, and less valued. So I think it's, it's all part of the conversation that we're having here today on International Women's Day uh, a, a, about valuing women, uh, no matter what age, no matter what experiences they've had. And this is um, part of that, that package of how do we value women, how do we value women's work, how do we value women's contributions. You know, I have women who come to me who say, I've never worked. I say, have you raised children? Yes, I have. Well, that's work, honey. Mm. That's some of the hardest work that you will ever do is, is raising children and some of the most important work that you will ever do. In terms of the job, uh, the job seeker, um, I've been on it. I've lived on it um, as a single mum. What's it like? With two children. It's bloody hard. It's bloody hard when you're there at the shopping centre and you've got the groceries that you need to feed your children for the week and you have to go to the counter and you have to put half of them back because you know you can't afford them. That's what it's like. That is what it's like. Even with that, with the, the, the family allowance that you speak of, Susan, oh, when I had two boys raising two boys that was barely enough to cover what they needed for school every day. It is incredibly hard. And I understand, yes, you have to have a balance between incentivising people to work, um, but you don't incentivise people to work by putting them in poverty. Yeah. <laughs> you, you just don't. I mean, look at, look at the cost of public transport. Look at the cost of public transport. To go to a job interview in the city in Perth, if you live in the northern suburbs, you're looking at 15, 15 to $30 just for public transport. When you're on a limited income, that's a hell of a lot of money. Hell of a lot of money. So, you know, oh, I think we need more politicians who have lived on it. And the fact is, let me tell you this, when we're in Canberra, do you want to know how much we get in travel allowance? $285 a day. That's how much we get for our hotel and our food. And that's about how much we give people a week to live on. It's disgusting. So, Megan... Just to go a little bit beyond the political positions on this, because we know well the government says, look, it is not a single payment. It always comes with additional payments. You need to look at the, the breadth of all of that. Does the totality of it um, enable someone to get back into work? I mean, it, you look at this stuff all the time. Well, that depends a lot of the time, you know, on luck and opportunities and the opportunities people are given. We do know that when they increased uh, these payments as part of COVID, it lifted a, a whole group of people, including mothers that have a raising children out of poverty. And by reducing it down, a lot of those people are going to be back in poverty. Um, the only thing I would say to Beverly is... Uh, Beverly's fantastic. <laughs> you should be working in an electorate office because you'd be dynamite. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, I suppose, not this is terribly helpful, you've got to make your own luck. I suggest you uh, set up a coaching service for women. I'm happy to be your first client because you seem to have lots of good ideas. All right. Can I? Sorry. Very, yeah, we've got to move on because we've got I, to... I know we have to move on, but my issue is that there's no work for women over the age of 50. That's true. There is no work. There's over a million people unemployed. Um, looking for a very, very few jobs. Mm. And the first ones to be booted off the jobs, especially with the government's new policy on women? employing younger people over older people, it's the older people that are thrown away. The value that they bring is lost to us as a society. That's the final word on that topic Sorry. for tonight because we've got to get to author and feminist Isabel Allende. Now, we've put your questions to her from her home in California. She'll be sharing her wisdom with Sydney's All About Women Festival this Sunday, and our first question for Isabel tonight comes from Clara Smythe. Uh, um, are we sending a confusing message and mi mixed messages to girls? On the one hand, we're told not to tell little girls they are very pretty, so they're not objectified. Then, on the other hand, the media rewards women by enlisting those who have spent thousands tens of thousands of dollars on plastic surgery to increase their chances to be chosen for a reality show. And I've used an example, um, MAFS, Married at First Sight. <laughs> <laughs> Isabella Yende. Yeah, it's a bit of a conundrum. Well, that's one of the many things that the feminist movement, especially the young wave of feminists, have, has been challenging. Um, I don't think there is anything wrong with being pretty or feeling pretty, being self-confident and feeling good in your body. 
but uh, you don't have to change anything. And then that shouldn't be uh, something imposed from outside. It should be something that you feel inside. Isabel, some young women seem to be cautious about calling themselves feminists. Why do you think that is? Because men have been very successful in depicting women who are feminists as hairy bitches that don't shave their armpits and they, they are main haters. That is not true. That is, that is a cliche invented by the right and by, the, by some males. And it has sort of caught on. So women, young women especially, feel that it's not sexy to be a feminist. Well, I'm telling you, call yourself whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Don't call yourself a feminist, but do the work. OK, Isabel, our next question comes to you from Steve Bentley in Ipswich in Queensland. We know men abuse power. Throughout history, there has been no respite from male rulers abusing power. 2020 showed us just how bad this can get. If women rule the world, would we have war, weapons of mass destruction, billionaires, overpopulation, religion, poverty and homelessness, climate catastrophe, massive habitat destruction, abusive pornography, domestic violence and violent crime in general. Women are not responsible for the items on this list. Well, I would like to meet this gentleman, really. He has summarised what patriarchy is all about. Uh, when, when I talk about feminism being a, an uprising, a struggle against patriarchy, I'm not saying against men, because we need men. We need men like that gentleman and like my son and like the new generation of young men who are also fed up with the world as it is. And it's not about replacing patriarchy by a matriarchy because we don't know how that would work. But to have a management of the world in which men and women in equal numbers and with equal, equal power would make the decisions. Uh, Isabel, you say in your new book uh, that you were an angry child. Uh, what was your mum's reaction to that? Didn't she start taking you to doctors? Yeah. Uh, they thought that there was something wrong with me. Maybe I had some tapeworm or something wrong with my brain because I was a, a weird kid. I mean, I didn't fit anywhere. I was rebellious. I was kicked out of the nun school when I was six. My mother thought that that her daughter wasn't going to have a very happy life. She told me once, she said, look, you can do anything you want, but do it discreetly. Don't make so much noise. And my reply was feminism without noise. What that, would that look like? Isabel, I know you won't be watching Australian politics closely where you are, but we are having a big debate in this country about the treatment of women in our politics, in our national life. Do you think the solutions lie in getting the gender balance right in the buildings where decisions are made, or is there more to it than that? I think that's the beginning. That's where we start. Um, without that um, critical number, nothing much changes. The pendulum doesn't move. Uh, Isabel, our next question is from Mark Darcy from Rye in Victoria. Isabel Allende, your stories are full of spiritual references. Given that, I wonder what you think about the idea of romance and desire being spiritual rather than requiring a physical expression or outlet. Wow, that's a lovely idea. A lovely idea that I should explore. For me, unfortunately, that has not happened. <laughs> but, but I'm, especially at my age, I'm totally willing to explore that. I'll talk to my husband tonight. So how important then is the physical? You said that you're 78 now. How valuable is that to you today? It still is. Yeah, there is a lot of demands on my husband. <laughs> so, so give us an insight into the future, Isabel. Does, does the sex get better, more beautiful with age or does it get more difficult? Difficult, of course. But you can replace, you know, energy. You can replace the energy with laughter and marijuana and... Um, <laughs> I don't know, companionship, kindness, but humour, good humour helps a lot. You've talked, though, about getting divorced in your 70s. Has it surprised you, the capacity for love and for renewal in these later decades of your life? You know, when I divorced, I was 72, and I really thought 
that I would spend the rest of my life without a male companion. Because at that age, it's almost impossible to find someone that would be interested in me. Older men, they look terrible, by the way. They think that they are entitled to women 30 years younger. What are they thinking? They are crazy. <laughs> but for some reason, there was a man who heard me on the radio, and he started emailing me every day. He was a lawyer from New York, a widower. He emailed me every day in the morning and in the evening. So finally, he sold his house, gave away everything it contained, and moved to California with two bikes and his clothes, which were very dated, so I had to throw them away. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we've been living ever since together, and we have both changed. We have both changed a lot. And it's been a wonderful, how could I say, renewal, discovery. It's like, like a new life in, in many ways. And I'm happy that it's happening. Isabel Allende, on that note, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, please come and say hi in person next time. OK, thank you so much. Take care. I want to wrap this up with some questions to all of you. <laughs> and Ali, how important is the physical side of love? Really, Hamish? Yeah. Really? <laughs> I told you this was coming. Oh, my goodness. Like, I'm, I think I'm blushing and I don't blush. <laughs> um, can I just, first of all, before I answer that question, say happy birthday to my mum. She turns 87 today, so happy yeah. birthday, Hamida. <laughs> Well, listen, I went to say, yeah, but yes, it's it's um, it's very important. I mean, Isabella Lunday makes me feel like an underperformer now. <laughs> um, um, yes, it's incredibly um, important. Um, but you know, I'm on my third marriage. If you didn't, if you didn't know, so like. Um, I got divorced in my 20s, divorced in my 30s, divorced in my 40s, and I'm on my third marriage. This one's a keeper, though, just putting it out there. Um, and and I've um, had to learn a whole new way of having a relationship and um, having a healthy relationship and what that means. Um, and, yes, that's a really important part of it, but I think the, the, the spiritual and the friendship and being able to rely on each other um, is something that I didn't have in my previous relationships, and I've got it with this one, so I'm incredibly blessed. I did want to get to all of you. We're running out of time. Sorry. Kate Crawford. The physical? I, look, I have to say one thing, which is, can Isabella Allende run for Prime Minister? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, can we have her? She's amazing. Right. And, you know, frankly... Let's not waste her on that. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Sam. Good point. I mean, and Beverly, I mean, what a, what a great evocation of your point that, you know, it's women over the age of 65 who are really bringing the wisdom that we need. Yeah. So, obviously, to love and to Isabella, my only great sadness is that I don't get to hang out with her at the Opera House this weekend at All About Women. We miss her. You got your plug in. That's all we've got time for tonight. <laughs> Please thank our wonderful panel, Senator Susan MacDonald, Samantha Maiden, Danya Marnie, and Ali and Kate Crawford. Please thank you. <laughs> yeah, they deserve the big applause, don't they? Next week, we are live in Melbourne discussing the end of JobKeeper and where Australia goes next in our economic recovery. We're giving the last word tonight to a talented young poet, Hani Adile. She's written a brand new poem, especially for tonight's program. Here she is with Woman's Day. On International Women's Day, I sat and watched powerful women shining, sharing their stories, raising toward the stars. I saw eyes that had witnessed pain, but turned into a joy. I saw unity for equality, and I was overwhelmed, empowered to stand still, to ride my fear, to embrace my tears. Each drop is a word. Then I reflected on the solemn woman within me. She is walking on a thin thread, sharper than a razor blade. She is physically free, but mentally chained. Her daily life is like milking a cow on a sand. She has a vision, but her eyes are blurred, bleeding for one stable life. She grew up before her time with her fire burning her tongue, her feet collapsing. She is a broken glass. She is a broken glass dropped from, dropped between continents. She lives in hope, 
Determination is painted in her cells. The solemn woman will never know when all she had bidded will be taken away by an angry flood, a system that is built to wipe her meaning away. Well, you would agree I'm a refugee, but keep me in temporary, keep me in uncertainty, temporary, not quite free to see what I could be with the future before me. And this poem, this poem is a note for my unborn child. You will be born into progress. You will get to know being strong is the uniform of every woman. You will read these notes over and over. You will realize your mama, when she joined the firm, there were already seats on the ground. All she did, she gave them water every day. But you, Ayeyo, your grandmother, grew up when the roads of equality were unknown, when oppression was their only choice. Please don't leave your mind. Please don't leave your dreams incompleted. And don't, and don't leave your mind complicated. Don't let anyone silence your voice.